Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 117 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be talking about things that I think are important, that I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, criticisms, praise, whatever about the show, contact me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can uh, leave a comment there or you can get the email address from there. If you do email me, please be sure to include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. And as always, please be a little patient about getting an answer. I'm a little slow about answering email, but I do answer it. All right, this week, I think the obvious thing that I'm going to have to start with, the obvious thing I'm going to have to talk about is the trial of George Zimmerman. And I've been finding it hard to do. I've been finding it hard to, to organize what I want to say because there's so very much I do want to say. And I found it hard, finding it hard to organizing it in a way that it just smoothly goes from A to B to C to D and so on. So instead of trying to do that, I'm going to start with my uh, bottom line assessment of the verdict. George Zimmerman got away with murder. Or, if you want to be legally technically correct, he got away with, I think, manslaughter. Uh, that is, manslaughter is the reckless, unnecessary, unjustifiable killing of another human being. Unfortunately, it appears that in Florida, you can do that. You can do that, or at least you can, if your victim is black, and you can claim that you were just so terrified, so threatened, so overwhelmed by the massive power of an unarmed black teenager that you had to kill him in order to save your own life. Now, that's true even if you're the one following him. It's true, and you're doing it because they're suspicious, they're on drugs or something. It's true even if... Uh, you're following him because these a-holes always get away and you're doing it even after the police dispatcher told you not to. You can do it even it's true even if according to your own statements when you were confronted you didn't identify yourself you didn't say anything about the neighborhood watch you just demanded what are you doing because at that point, if at, you can do all this because if at any point a scuffle ensues, and if at any point during that fight you think you're losing the fight, you think you might get hurt, you can take out that gun and blow him away. In Florida, that apparently is legal. And in fact, there were several legal analysts who said that the jury really had no choice but to acquit Zimmerman because of the bizarre, twisted nature of Florida's laws. And that was true especially after the judge refused to clarify her very muddled explanation of what constitutes manslaughter. As John Oliver said on The Daily Show, uh, the real outrage here is not that the system was broken, but that the system worked. The system worked the way it was supposed to, to let such as George Zimmerman walk free. And now, Justice Department officials are saying that Zimmerman very likely will not face any federal charges as a result of killing Trayvon Martin because a successful prosecution would require proving he did it out of racial bias, and they admit that would be very hard to actually prove in a court of law. I don't know how to talk about that. I don't know how to talk about a system that never took the matter seriously until public outcry forced them to. I mean, let's not forget, let's not forget that initially police took George Zimmerman's claim of self-defense at face value. The cops drug tested the dead victim, but not the live shooter. The cops did a background check on the dead victim, but not on the live shooter. Instead, they gave the live shooter his gun back and just let him walk free. How do you talk about that? How do you talk about a system so ethically corrupt, so astonishingly amoral, so blatantly rigged in favor of the killer over the killed? But it's often true in cases like this. Oh, and there have been so many other 
cases like this. From Oscar Grin, Oakland, to um, Kamani Gray in Brooklyn, to Wendell Allen in New Orleans, to uh, Terrence Franklin in Minneapolis. There have been so many others. What's often true is that the details of the particular case are not as revealing as the reactions to those cases. There were, for example, in this case, numerous attempts to smear Trayvon Martin, to smear him as a thug. In fact, one cop called Trayvon Martin a thug who deserved to die. He was smeared as a drug dealer with a history of violence, all this basically based on vapor. Um, there were menacing pictures of him, increasingly menacing pictures, some of them so menacing they weren't even him. All of this was intended to whitewash the crime, to make it okay for Trayvon Martin to be dead, to make it okay for George Zimmerman to have shot him, because in too many minds, it could not have been a wrong thing for him to have killed a black kid. In the wake of the verdict, the right-wingers and other assorted bigots were alight with joy, except for the fact that rather well, I almost said perversely, but when you think about it, it's really not perverse. They actually seem to be rather disappointed that riots had not broken out in African and neighbor, neighborhood, African American neighborhoods around the country. That reaction, too, is revealing. So right now, at this point, I'm not talking about George Zimmerman. Right now, I'm not even concerned about George Zimmerman. There are a lot of indications that George Zimmerman is a racist, um, including a long history of calling police to complain about suspicious African Americans. But even if he's not, even if he's not a racist, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the broader reaction is what matters, and that broader reaction tells us a lot about our society, and it, what it tells us about that society is not pretty. We are, in fact, a society suffused with racism, infused with racism, infected with racism. A society in which a young black man, and yes, Zimmerman did say that Trayvon Martin looked black, a young black man is suspicious simply by virtue of being a young black man. More, not just young and not just man. Black bodies, simply by virtue of being black, are associated with behavior and actions that, that are inherently des uh, uh, regarded as dangerous and suspicious, regardless of what they themselves are actually doing. Consider the case of 14-year-old Tremaine McMillan. On May 30th, he was slammed to the ground and choked by two Miami-Dade police cops because they claim he gave them a dehumanizing stare and clenched his fists. They say that created an immediate threat which they had to neutralize. In other words, you got these two adult armed cops who were so intimidated by a 14-year-old giving them a dirty look that they had no choice but to slam him to the ground and choke him until he urinated on himself. Children, men, women, all regarded with suspicion and fear because of their color, their very bodies a mark against them. You want an example? I'll give you one. Last year, Don Derbyshire, who was a columnist for the National Review, he described the talk he would have with his children about dealing with black people. Now, among his bits of advice, beyond, by the way, saying that the average black person is a lot less intelligent than the average white person, uh, his, his advice was this. Avoid concentrations of blacks not all known to you personally. Stay out of heavily black neighborhoods. Do not attend events likely to draw a lot of blacks. If you're at a public event in which the number of blacks suddenly swells, leave as quickly as possible. Do not settle in a district or municipality run by black politicians. Do not act the good Samaritan to blacks in apparent distress. If accosted by a strange black in the street, smile and say something polite, but keep moving. In other words, to be black is to be suspected, it is to be dangerous. That's certainly the attitude in New York City with its infamous stop and frisk policy. Under Mayor Mike the Billionaire Bloomberg, there have been over 5 million stop and frisks. Over 86% of them have been on blacks or Latinos. Now, to stop a person lawfully, Got to understand, a cop needs to have a reasonable suspicion that the person has committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime. 
Despite that, 88% of the stops did not result in an arrest or a summons, and of course, an even smaller proportion ultimately led to a conviction. Which means that these cops, they're supposedly judging that there is a crime going on here. Judges are good, they have reasonable suspicion that there is a crime going on here, and they were wrong over 90% of the time. But none of that matters to Bloomberg or to Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, who insists nobody racially profiles. Oh, it just doesn't happen. In fact, Bloomberg said, I think, quoting him, I think we disproportionately stop whites too much and minorities too little. Black and Latino males aged 14 to 24 make up less than 5% of New York's population, but they made up nearly 42% of those stopped and frisked. But nobody racially profiles in New York, of course not. Which moves me toward another point. Consider the case of Henry Louis Gates. Now you remember this. This is the one where he uh, had to force his way into his house, got locked out of his house. The police got a call, a cop went to investigate. He confronted Gates, and at some point Gates produced ID to show that he was in his own house. None of that is in dispute. What also happened, though, is that there was some kind of argument between the two, uh, with the result that Gates was arrested on the classic bogus charge of disturbing the peace, an arrest that happened because, as everyone seems to agree, that um, Gates mouthed off to the cop and the cop took his cheap revenge. And again, we have the revealing reaction. In a number of comments in this, Gates was criticized as foolish or blundering or making a rookie mistake by arguing with the cop. Everyone knows you don't do that, we were told. It's unwise. It just gets you into trouble. It's crazy to defy a cop. Black people are supposed to approach every encounter with police thinking that this person, this cop, is prepared to abuse their authority, to violate the law, to violate their rights, perhaps even go off the deep end and become violent. So they must maintain the right attitude. They must be respectful, passive, obedient, subservient. They're supposed to act like serfs in the feudal estate, shuffling their feet, tugging at their forelocks, and casting their eyes downward in the presence of the lord of the manor, even if they are a highly respected, tenured professor inside their own home. Because to do otherwise is to act crazy. And frankly, there are enough dead black people with bullets, police bullets in them, to justify that claim. Because if you are black, you are a suspect, you are dangerous, you are a threat. And so in every encounter, you must be more than innocent, you must be more than harmless, you must instead be less of a person, you must shrink inside yourself to become lesser than you are. And you're supposed to simply put up with that. You're supposed to simply accept it because that's the way it is. You're supposed to accept this for your own safety because that's the way it is. And you're supposed to do that because that's the way it is. You want to know how it is? I'll show you how it is. Look at this graph. Look at this graph. Now I have to explain this graph to you. There was some research done to see if stand your ground laws were having any impact on the outcome of court cases. That's what this graph is about, but it shows something else quite clearly. Now, what you have to understand is that the standard used, the baseline used, was the acquittal rate for, uh, for self-defense claims in the cases where a white person was accused of killing a white person. That was the baseline. Okay, so what does this say? First, it says if it's a case of a black person killing a black person, a claim of self-defense is about 25% less likely to succeed in the case of a white killing a white. If it's a black killing a white, it's 75% less likely to succeed. But if it's a white person accused of killing a black person, a claim of self-defense is nearly two and a half times more likely to succeed than in the case of a white person killing a white person. And if you invoke stand your ground, it's three and a half times more likely to succeed. Black lives matter less than white lives. Black victims matter less than white victims. As Paul Campos wrote at Salon, quoting him, Trayvon Martin was stalked by George Zimmerman because he was black. Trayvon Martin is dead because he is black. George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon Martin because the boy Zimmerman killed was black. If you deny those things, you are either a liar or an idiot or possibly both. When are we going to admit to ourselves that racism and bigotry, that rancid, putrid, vomit-inducing paranoia and ignorance 
is alive and thriving in our society and has been since the beginning. You know, and not only against blacks, not only against blacks. Hispanics, for example, are just the latest target of our isolationist xenophobia. We can trace this back generation by generation, group by group, target by target. Asians, Poles, Italians, Irish, Jews, Catholics, any wave of immigrants that was different, that in other words wasn't a wasp, any wave of immigrants, any wave of different people, we heard the same things. It's going to destroy the country. It's going to undermine it. These foreigners are dirty. They're filthy. They're all this other sort of nonsense. In fact, we can trace this right back to Native Americans, and they weren't even immigrants. Our record on this is a shameful one. It may not be the worst. It may not even be that bad in comparison to some other countries. That doesn't change the fact it's shameful. So I don't want to hear a single, a, a single hint, a single breath, a single whisper that we are a post-racial society. Anyone says that to you is lying, either to you or to themselves. I don't know which. The fact is we are suffused with racism, along with sexism and homophobia, but we are steeped in our bigotry until it penetrates our souls. Now, yes, 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 it's getting better. Yes, it has been worse in the past. Yes, we can see an impact. We can see, for example, how bigotry now is more commonly expressed with a wink and a nod, with dog whistles, not with the overt filth of the old sort. But if you as an adult watching this, if you want to think to yourself, if you want to argue to me that racism had nothing to do with why Trayvon Martin is dead and George Zimmerman is still walking around free, then I want nothing to do with you, nor should any other person of decent conscience who has two synapses to rub together. And we are taking a break. And, uh, and here we're back. So, uh, sort of continuing with the same thing, we're going to go to one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given, as always, for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to juror B37 in the George Zimmerman trial. This is the woman who wanted to acquit George Zimmerman from the get-go because his heart was in the right place and who planned to do a tell-all book about the trial until even she decided that was a little too tacky. I think, quoting her, I think George Zimmerman is a man whose heart was in the right place but just got displaced by the vandalism in the neighborhood and wanted to catch these people so badly. In other words, he was just a good boy who made an honest little mistake because he just cared so much. None of it was his fault. Even though the police dispatcher told Zimmerman to stop following Martin, the dispatcher, according to juror B-37, actually kind of egged him on, she said. What's more, she declared that in whatever altercation occurred, well, Martin probably threw the first punch, that he got mad and attacked him, that is, Zimmerman. Which she maintained despite also saying no one knows exactly what happened. In other words, no one knows what happened, but it was all Trayvon Martin's fault. Trayvon Martin, she said, quoting, played, played a huge role in his death. It was his own fault that he got killed. Apparently, in her mind, George Zimmerman was the one walking home with a can of iced tea and a pack of Skittles. Oh, and by the way, race had nothing to do with this, she says. Nothing at all to do with it. Whoever it was, Spanish, white, Asian, whoever it was, she said, Zimmerman would have reacted exactly the same way. As for the gun, she said, quoting again, I think it's everybody's right to carry a gun as long as you are responsible and use it the way you should be using it. Which apparently, in her mind, is exactly what George Zimmerman did. She was far enough out there that four of the other jurors issued a joint statement bashing her for leading the country to believe that she spoke for the whole jury. Her opinions, they said, were not in any way representative of theirs. Now, the acquittal of George Zimmerman, as ethically and morally outrageous as it is, may have been legally necessary due to the twisted nature of Florida's laws. But to turn this into poor George, to turn the stalker, to turn the shooter into the good boy with the good heart victimized by a physical attack by somebody else is the act of a complete clown. All right, from there to our other regular weekly feature, this is the outrage of the week. 
And this week, it comes from one of our regular sources, Fox News, or faux news, as they would properly be called. They wanted to have somebody come on to comment on the acquittal of George Zimmerman. So who did they pick? A notorious race-baiting right-wing conspiracy monger named J. Christian Adams. This nut job was the one who claimed the Department of Justice dropped voter intimidation charges uh, that date from an incident in 2008 against two members of the new Black Panther Party because of the radical racial agenda of the Obama administration and not due to the actual fact of the matter, which was that there was absolutely no evidence anybody was actually intimidated. But Fox has never given up on harping on the new Black Panthers, regarding them as a convenient tool to stir racial fears, even though the group itself is a fringe of a fringe and seems to contain, uh, seems to consist mostly of a, of a relative handful of guys with baseball bats and a leather fetish. So you can guess what happened here. Adams not only charged that the NAACP has teamed up with the new Black Panthers because the NAACP wanted the DOJ to uh, investigate charging uh, Zimmerman under civil rights laws. He insisted that the new Black Panthers were actually the spark behind, that's a quote, the spark behind the whole investigation into Trayvon Martin's death. That the whole thing only happened because the new Black Panthers went down there and threatened people. And the Justice Department, he said, responded to their demands. Now, faux news host Steve Doofus then wondered aloud why the Department of Justice is taking their marching orders from the new Black Panther Party before Adams renewed his old claim of a radical racial agenda on the part of Attorney General Eric Holder. Now, at a time when you would think that racial tensions would be a little bit higher than normal, uh, as African-American communities across America watch as the killer of yet another black man walks free. At a time when those communities are being the ones, they're, 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 they're being told that they are the ones who must show restraint, they are the ones who must remain calm, they are the ones who must control their emotions. Faux news is about its business, its business as usual, of stoking racial fears. It is foul, it is disgusting, it is evil, and it is an outrage. All right, let's let's get away from that for now. For now, to uh, something that uh, that actually has some some better news to it. I got a, a couple of bits of news uh, about things related to um, same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage. Uh, the first one is not good news, but it's interesting news. Indiana officials are now making a big point of saying that it's a felony in Indiana to submit false information on a marriage license application. The thing is, the application includes designations male applicant and female applicant, so there's no way a same-sex couple could actually fill out that form completely truthfully. Some folks, including me, suspect that the state what the state's actually doing is trying to head off a possible court case about the state's law uh, against same-sex marriage. You see, such suits are usually initiated by a same-sex couple filing for a marriage license and getting denied. Well, in this case, the state is raising the possibility that doing that uh, raises the possibility of three years in prison. And so the state may be hoping to intimidate people into not making this ch uh, a challenge in the first place. Now, the fact that this is happening at the same time as the uh, right-wing controlled state legislature is trying to push through a bill to put a referendum for a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage uh, on the November 2014 ballot. It adds to the suspicion about the, about the state's actions uh, since those anti-justice forces may be thinking, all right, we don't actually have to prevent such a suit. We just have to forestall it until after, hopefully, this amendment passes. And it's a lot, obviously a lot harder to overturn a constitutional amendment than a, than a law. Now, that may work. It may not. The Proposition 8 case uh, only directly affected California because the Supreme Court did not actually decide the case. What they did is they let the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling stand, which upheld the trial judge. The thing is, the original trial judge's finding of fact and opinion found that constitutional state constitutional bans against same-sex marriage violate the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Prop 8 lawyer David Boyce has argued that this should now apply nationwide and all of these should be struck down. 
Recent polls say a majority of Hoosiers are actually against this proposed amendment, but uh, such majorities have faded before in, in the uh, face of the fear mongers, so, you know, watch this space. On a happier note, the American Civil Liberties Union has filed a lawsuit against Pennsylvania's ban on same-sex marriage, and Pennsylvania State Attorney General Kathleen Lane, uh, uh, Kathleen Kane, rather, has announced that she won't defend the law. She cited the state constitution's ban on discrimination and said, quoting, it is now the time here in Pennsylvania to end another wave of discrimination. Now, the governor and other right-wingers in the state are, of course, furious with her, but she argues that um, if she's convinced that a law is unconstitutional under either the state or the federal constitution, that ethics, that legal ethics require her to not defend it. The ACLU, by the way, is filing similar suits in North Carolina and Virginia and plans to do so in other states soon. Finally, the best news here. British lawmakers have passed the bill legalizing same-sex marriage in England and Wales and requires only legally the signature of the Queen, which is really a formality, could happen by the end of this week. And the first same-sex marriages are, expe are expected to take place by next summer. All right, we're going to finish out here with a couple of updates of things we've talked about before. Uh, first, last week I mentioned uh, the Moral Monday protests in Cal uh, North Carolina. They're still going on. This, this Monday, July 15th, over 100 protesters uh, were arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience in the 11th consecutive Monday rally. Over 800 have been arrested for civil disobedience so far. This week, the turnout was prompted by another right-wing attempt to restrict abortion rights. I mentioned last week that they tried to do this by attaching uh, these restrictions to an anti-Sharia law bill. This week, they did it by attaching restrictions to a bill on motorcycle safety, which Governor Pat McCrory has said he'll sign despite having made a campaign promise to oppose any new restrictions. All right, second, on another update, I said last week that people power does not always produce justice. Egypt continues to show that as the military controlled government continues to clamp down on, dis on dissent. The public prosecutor has ordered the arrest of seven senior uh, Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic figures uh, over claims about violence between Brotherhood supporters and opponents in the days surrounding the, um, uh, uh, that Mohamed Morsi being deposed as president. The new, cab the new cabinet in Egypt, speaking of Egypt still, is comprised of what are called relative liberals. What that means in the context of Egypt is unclear, except that these are people obviously acceptable to the military. Uh, the Islamists who were elected last year were shut out entirely. Meanwhile, the Muslim Brotherhood continues to protest, like I said last week, watch this space. Finally. A couple of weeks ago, I gave a hero award to Texas State Senator Wendy Davis for her 11-hour filibuster of a special legislative session that, passed, uh, that prevented passage of a new, more severe restriction on abortion in Texas. I also noted that Governor Rick Oops Perry had already said he was going to call another special session to ram through the bill, which he did. And despite the best efforts of opponents, opponents which included the Texas Medical Association, the Texas Hospital Association, and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, that bill has actually now passed. So we're going to wrap up there, wrap up there for the week. Uh, I'll just leave you with our weekly reminder. As of July 17th, at least... 6,246 Americans have died as the result of gunfire since Newtown. At least 65 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week.